Hi folks, Dave Woodard, the man from the East. I am uh, making this video. A lot of people have asked to put everything together in one video. I feel like there's a few videos that I put out there that are like that. But this one, this one's pretty much going to have um, kind of snippets along the whole way. I'm going to try to put everything inside this video that explains um, from start to finish how Force Pen included everything in this solve that I've put out. Um, what lines up, the names of the books, the hints that are in the book, the way that the poem works out in order, everything together explained as I go along and what connects with each other. I'm going to try to make it the most in-depth video I've done so far. So you can see pretty much how it all fits together. So I just wanted to state that at the beginning of this video. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you give me a thumbs up. Uh, but as far as any other videos about the actual solve, um, <clears throat> I, I'm pretty much burnt out on trying to explain it to people who don't who don't really want the answers. They, they want to keep going with the way they're going. And it's kind of sad because a lot of the Forest Fan community has asked for the truth to come out. And I've given it. I've given how, why, and who. Um, but they just don't want to. They don't want to accept it. They don't want to listen to it. So the real people out there that do, there are there are some of the Fan community that, that do. But overall... Nobody even wants to watch my videos. Nobody brings up my name in their videos. Um, I've tried to respond. Uh, Barbara Anderson was on live. I tried to respond with a few questions. She wouldn't even answer me. So it's, it's all... This whole community, <clears throat> they say they want answers. But they don't want to accept somebody else's answers. Which is fine. I even... Uh, I believe that right now, as far as anybody solved that is top notch, that people are interested in or wondering about, uh, probably why must I go and myself? Uh, that's those are the two that I can think of that people have solves out there. Others have their solves they don't want to put out or they have put out. I haven't seen them. I apologize if if your solve is is pretty much uh, top notch, but it's. Uh, as far as why must I go, we used to be friends. This message was from about four months ago from why must I go. By the way, keep up the good work. Refreshing to hear solutions instead of boneheads trying to hone in on the BS fed to them by Jack. They can't solve the poem, so they are trying to force anything Jack said into f their ending. The result equals a location they can't prove and they have no solves showing how to get there. You are showing a solve already miles ahead of people who can't come up with a good one. He <laughs> he. And then all of a sudden, he hates me because I guess I just challenged him too much on my solve. Then it turned into, the answer is simple, Dave. The chess was not in New Mexico. Your solve is therefore wrong. You are making claims that Forrest committed perjury. On the legal documents he submitted under oath, to the court in August 2020. On those documents, Forrest states clearly the treasure chest was found in the state of Wyoming in the same spot I hid it back in 2010. You can't get any more clear than that. So you never solved any part of the poem. It is proven right there. If you want to claim Forrest lied under oath, then why don't you try to do that legally and also risk being countersued for defaming him? You believe Forrest enough to assume that the to assume that the treasure existed and it was not a hoax, and yet here you are claiming he lied simply because your solve was wrong. How does that make any sense? Your story would be valid if your solve and all the clues were in Wyoming, but that is not the case. The only people concerned with the solution are the ones who are in the right state to begin with. You need to accept the fact that you lost. I believe we solved the poem and I proved it. However, we know that we also lost. This is no reward for not finding the chest. 
We've accepted that we lost. This is why I find it silly when people who were not even in the right state create bullshit drama because they are mad. They did not solve the poem. Move on, man. Not a single person agrees with you except for the troll accounts you create in order to agree with yourself. This is clearly a different man from the inspirational Why Must I Go that was telling me great job and it was refreshing to hear a good solve. Before I took the fame away from the bullshit lies in Wyoming. Uh, being right over his. So then he he started to get a little bit a little bit more upset with all of the things that uh, were coming out. So him and I are rivals now, apparently. Um, but I, I don't dis I don't try to diss his solve when you disrespect me. Sometimes you get it back. So Anyways, this video should have everything inside of it that people need to understand exactly what it, what happened and what the solve is and how it all pulls together. I'll do my best, but after this, uh, it's it's on everybody else. I, I'll wait for the book company to get a hold of me to uh, to put a book out because when when and that's why I said. The Olds and the Fens are waiting to see this community or the world to understand what really happened and where the real, real solve is. And that that's why they're not putting anything out. It was supposed to be August 22nd last year, 2021, that they were supposed to come out with a big reveal. But they've been hesitating and waiting. And they keep learning more and more information about my solve. So they, they, they know they can't put something out because when you people finally do realize that this is the actual solve and what I've said is all true, they have to come up with some kind of explanation. Bottom line. So here's the actual everything right in a row, all the solve. And uh, I don't know how long this video is going to end up being, but it's it's there's a lot of information I'm going to put in here. So I hope you enjoy it. Thumbs up. Follow. Thank you. Dave Woodard, the man from the East. Okay, folks. Those three books are the books that I'm going to be concentrating on, the titles, and how they in, incorporate into the solve. Uh, I'm also going to concentrate at the beginning towards uh, some of the quotes that were made and a lot of the hints that bring these titles to the, the solve. So, before I get started, I do want to say that this solve of mine Either the, whatever people call it, Superman solve, the Kent and Esther solve, it doesn't matter. It's all my solve from Forrest Fenn. It's what he intended somebody to figure out. And I'm the guy that did it. So I'm just letting you know, whatever it ends up being called, all rights are reserved by me for Kent and Esther or Superman. All right, so let's get started. As far as the thrill of the chase, the chase is what is most critical right there. That chase, if you look up the definition, is a trench uh, to put something in or lie in or pass through. So that trench, and I didn't even realize it, but the beginning of the book, you know, this little guy is standing in a trench, right? A lot of people look for clues on the front covers. I've been calling it a ravine. It's not a ravine. It's actually, if you look up the definition of chase, it's a trench. So I just wanted to specify that. There's so many clues that pull in for the trench and that hidden, it's a hidden trench that leads up. The ravine is several hundred feet wide and this channel, this trench is not. I made that mistake. I just, I didn't look up the definition precisely. So that trench.
that leads up to that fire pit, his blaze, that's hidden. And that's what the thrill is. When he was a kid, he used to go up to that area, through that trench. Uh, right now, it's loaded with trees. So if you decide to go up, be careful. Or go behind the outhouse that's in the picnic area. Go up the hill there and bear right. And it'll bring you up onto that ridge uh, when you get far enough up. So there's many times the forest fen mentions the chase. He's literally talking about the trench that leads up there. And he also says in a few times, um, the, the thrill of the chase, when he talks about the thrill in the book, he says it was a thrill of knowing the place was there just for us in, uh, in looking for Lewis and Clark. Cimarron State Park wasn't established as a state park until 1979. So all that time, way before that, when Forrest was a kid, that is what he's talking about. It was there just for him and Donnie and whoever he took to that secret place uh, when he went up on that ridge to the fire pit. That's where he camped. That was his hidden area. When Forrest Ben talks about his secret spot, it's not something that is is 10 miles in the, into the wilderness. It's somewhere that's close to a, a really good fishing spot that is really populated now when you look at uh, his description in Flywater. And I, I'll be getting to that. But that specific area is just his alone that he knows about. And it's hidden. And that's what this place is. You're up on that ridge. And that's why he says you look quickly down after you find the blaze. This all lines up perfectly, and, and I'm giving you the reasons why. But that chase, that specific trench that he's talking about, that channel that leads up to the fire pit, it all fits perfectly at Palisade Sill. And I will be showing you a ton more. So I just wanted to let you know that state park is definitely, it wasn't a state park until 1979. So it was just an open area where people would cruise through with their vehicles. And that was part of the thrill. When he said talks about jumping the milk truck, I believe it was, um, he said it's part of the thrill was dodging the cars. So in Golden Moor, which is a story about hiding the treasure chest, he says, for me, it was always the thrill of the chase. This is specifically telling you that that trench was that important and it's where he hid the treasure. About a certain place and he especially says it at the front cover of um, the thrill of the chase. If you uh, put a picture up here, he says the thrill of that chase. That's not a misspelled word. He's specifically talking about that trench that leads up from Palisade Sill up to his hidden area. And he's specifically tells you by that by that statement okay moving on to another quote in the book my church is in the mountains if you are at palisade sill across from it on the ridge that i'm talking about that's his secret area if you look back up onto palisade sill there's a cross that is way up on top of that mountain that you can see I, i've zoomed in on it looking at it but my camera didn't take a great picture. But these pictures will show you. This is taken from where Forrest's secret area was. And also down the, down the canyon a little ways at Ponderosa Campground. The backside of the campground, that mountain that's up there, there's another cross up on top of that. That, um, that is the reasons why he called my churches in the mountains. You have a cross right across from Palisade Sill that you, nobody even knows about that you can't see from down below. But you can see it from his secret area. You're up high enough on that ridge to be able to see it. And these pictures will prove that. Okay, let's move on to the double omegas. A lot of people believe that the double omegas are very important. I never did. Uh, but then one time I was at the canyon out of the 8 to 10 trips I've taken... I picked up on, on something I thought would be considered uh, significant for the double omegas. And now the, he has double omegas in every single book in the back. 
Uh, but the last book, he finally changed up. He finally put the Caliphant, which is his emblem, but he still had one single Omega. So my reasoning behind this is with those um, curve signs of 25 miles an hour, because that spot up near Clear Creek, right before Palisade Sill, you have Clear Creek that's, that's maybe a mile up the road. So that area right there, you have two signs on each side of that corner, right next to Clear Creek, that are, uh, they look like they could be Omega signs uh, to me. So I believe that's why he put them in there. And they're, they're separated. So maybe that's why he put the one this time to uh, just change it up a little bit on the third book. Okay, I feel like I've covered um, the chase and the thrill of the chase pretty much. I want to move on to memoir uh, on the front cover of the book. The memoir uh, by uh, William Zinzer is a window into a life. Now, he's describing his life in these stories to all of us. And this is what we have to figure out. But if you look up windows, a window sill is equivalent to Palisade sill. And there's a story in here how you get to that point. And uh, I can, I'll put that up right now of how the actual connection from sill to Palisade sill transfers okay and gypsy magic here think about the way that Forrest is using his words I used to raise the window that was at the side of my bed and put my pillow on the sill I slept that way whenever I could he's actually telling you what's the normal way that somebody would say use that phrase so put my pillow on the window sill it would be that simple but he separates them there uh, window is your connection to Palisade Sill. And that's why he says it the way that he does. And then pillowed on the sill. He talks about pillowed down also, which is also another connection to the sill, Palisade Sill, when he's talking about a certain specific area. And if that window connection didn't get you to understand that it's Palisade Sill, uh, it did for me. But this one right here, someone asked me uh, quite a while ago. They said, what does, uh, on page 25 of uh, The Thrill of the Chase, there's a, a line that says, I was, I was sure a window pane somewhere in Mississippi was about to break. Now, I didn't know what that meant. I looked up uh, Palisades Park in New Jersey. Uh, I finally found recently what that actually means and it specifically to me pinpoints palisade sill in new mexico by the way he says this whole phrase and the reason being there is a palisade a mississippi palisade so the the line i was sure a window pane somewhere in mississippi was about to break now that right there specifically what, what does that mean to anybody? It doesn't mean anything to anybody unless you know that it, it connects to a palisade somewhere else. And it's in Mississippi. Missis palisade Park. Mississippi Palisade Park. It's in Illinois. But somebody said that. Oh, it's not in Mississippi. It's called Mississippi Palisade. So, so it you can't get any more simple than that. Okay, another connection that lines up with windows I thought was really cool. On page uh, 46, if you look at this picture, and you, a lot of people line up and switch the lines and move things around. Well, this is a perfect example of where to do that. Because it says, in paradise, on the windows, and no plumbing. That right there is, I think, is significant for being up on that ridge. There's no plumbing. It's paradise to him. It's a secret getaway. And uh, it's on the window. On the window. So the next one, this one is one of the most critical ones in the whole book as far as specifying looking out the window. So if you picture yourself on the south side of the highway in the canyon, the Palisade Silk, looking out 
You can look across at Palisade Cell, and this is what you see. The quote from the book, she didn't answer, but just kept nodding and looking out the window. I think she was watching for the postman or something. That quote right there, the postman or something, across from Palisade Cell from the south side is where you get the view of the devil's mailbox. That is a significant pinpoint area to let you know what all the postmarks are for on all the pictures in the book. Those postmarks, and she's staring out the window at the at for the postman or something. This is super, super critical for solving this whole thing and knowing that your search area is Palisade Sill. The window is the Palisade Sill, and she's staring, waiting for the postman or something. That's the only view, that's your best view, is from the south side of the highway, which is right where he buried the treasure. And this, this little quote is out of the story, Gold and More, which is the story where he hid the treasure. It all connects so beautifully. So as far as any postmarks, anybody tries to steer you any different than what this is, from staring out the window, waiting for the postman, that is, that is absolutely 100% positively so incredible for the solve of the postmarks. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move on to within 200 feet quote by Forrest Fenn. People have been within 200 feet. This quote is actually in the book, within 200 feet. Um, about the prehistoric people, I believe it is. Uh, he also brings up 200 feet in the war uh, story, My War for Me. And I haven't even checked the other books if there's another 200 foot in there. But there, I'm pretty sure there probably will be. But this quote right here, I think, got blown out of proportion uh, by some of the searchers uh, from way back. The actual 200 foot is on a sign that's at Clear Creek again. Clear Creek's just up a mile. And it has that sign that says 200 feet with an arrow pointing down the canyon towards... Um, Palisade Sill. It's it's 200 feet away from Clear Creek. So the answer is clear. You were within 200 feet if you go down to Palisade Sill. It's pretty much that simple. But actually that 200 foot sign somewhere around 2018 got wiped out in a car accident because the next summer that I went um, it was down on the ground. It was, it was gone. The 200 foot sign was gone. The other big Clear Creek sign uh, was still there. So that 200 foot is that sign in that canyon. That was a 200 foot clue that got changed over to 200 foot searcher somehow by someone. I'm not sure who, but he said within 200 feet and that's in the book, correct? So it's a clue, not a 200 foot searcher. But actually, if you're down at Palisade Cell looking for the treasure, anybody that was there, at some point, you're within 200 foot of the treasure, or 200 feet of, of where he put that cross, where he buried the treasure. So there were a lot of people that were within 200 feet of the actual treasure, and he said some people have been within 500 feet. Remember that quote? You are, if you're in Palisade cell area, searching around or in the parking area, you're 500 feet, it's my guess, it's around 500 feet up to where the blaze is. So that's where the 200 and 500 foot come in to play. Um, people have been within 200 feet and people have been within 500 feet. Okay? Okay, we're going to move on to geocaching in Cimarron Canyon. And why it's important. I never really use it as clues, but this really fits for that area in the canyon. Because that's where the geocaching is. Uh, for people who do that kind of thing. And Forrest actually put it in his books to let you know the, that area in Cimarron Canyon, uh, Palisades Hill, is, is known for that. Uh, it wasn't known to me. I didn't do the geocaching there. So, But this is, this is a few pictures to understand um, why it fits in where it fits in and how it fits in with uh, the mailbox. It says it on the mailbox. So... Even the Mississippi Palisades Park has geocaching 
inside all the activities at that park. So the geocaching or the cache or the opulent treasure, it's all connected here. Okay, now we're going to move on to the end of Force Fen's rainbow. Now, as far as why this is the actual blaze, I will get into later. But the actual end of Force Fen's rainbow is the fire pit that was up on top of the ridge in his hidden area. He used to take his fish up, uh, up there at the end of the day when he was younger and he would cook it up and that would be the end of his rainbow. It's where he would eat his day's catch. Um, he'd go down across the road, fish in the river, get a few fish and come back up and camp up there. This spot was one of his favorite spots in the world to go to because of the the view and everything else from it. But as far as the actual end of his rainbow, the way it is written is containing nine clues that have followed precisely will lead to the end of my rainbow and the treasure. So and is separating there. There's still a little bit more. After you find what the blaze is, there's still a little bit more that you have to do. Uh, and then you'll find the treasure. That is what that specifically means. Okay, this is where we transition from the first book to the second book on the actual importance of the chase itself, the trench. So I'm going to read it, a little portion of this. Several years ago, I wrote a book titled The Thrill of the Chase. In it, I spoke of a chest full of gold and precious gems that I hid in the mountains. A dare went out to everyone who possessed a sense of wonderlust. Now, this is an area that's the most important. Study the clues in the book and thread a tract through the wiles of nature in circumstance to the treasure. I warned that the path would not be direct for those who had no certainty of the location beforehand, but sure for the one who did. Okay, this right here, this is very important to understand what these words mean and how they connect with the actual chase. Okay, what we need to concentrate on is study the clues in the book and thread a tract through the wiles of nature. Okay, that part right there, he's talking about. We know that the definition of chase is trench. The other definition of chase is Groove, indent, to cut a thread. So now if you take to cut a thread, which means a chase, a trench, and put it into this sentence, uh, study the clues in the book and thread a tract. So now you're looking for a, a channel, a, a, uh, a chase, a trench. That's what thread a tract. We'll look at what tract means right now. So broken down, tract is a large area in a forest. So you are looking for a thread through a large area in the forest. And the wiles of nature and circumstance to the treasure. That I'll explain right now. So while, or wiles, as Forrest would say, is a trick. Someone's playing a trick on you. Uh, trickery. So it says the wiles of nature and circumstance to the treasure. So you need to follow that where that actual trench leads up to and you're going to end up after after all of this is done, you're going to end up back where you started and I'll show you why. So it's that's the trickery in this whole thing. It he leads you through this whole big path through the woods and up through the trench to find the fire pit and then you end up back where you started. And that's the crazy cool thing about this whole thing. So this is the actual part of the second book that has the map portion on it. So we're into the second book right now for what I'm going to show you how this all works out for the name of the book now on that part. Okay, we know that chase is a trench or it's also a th to cut a thread. We also know that a palisade is a wooden fence or structure or wall of trees. Now this part gets very interesting. A trench is a track cut through a wood. 
a trench through a wood through a palisade pretty interesting right Okay, this next part about too far to walk, that was going to be quick because this explanation is going to be in the map portion because it's actually in the, the whole poem, the nine clues and where it fits. So for me to explain it now and then go back over and explain it when I do the map portion, it's just not going to be uh, conducive to time-wise because this is going to be a long video. Uh, but the too far to walk, it's the section between... The first clue in the map, where begin at where Warm Waters Halt, and the home of Brown. That's where it falls in. It's 23 miles, and it's brought in that way because of the Vietnam War Memorial. Uh, he talks about the story about taking the chance of walking out of the Viet Cong or wherever he was in uh, that book. So I'm not going to go over that, but that is basically what the Too Far to Walk is. It's a section in the actual map. So I will be going over that later. But I will bring up one thing on the Too Far to Walk. Now that I just, I looked at it and I realized this, um, beginning where Warm Waters Halt is Agua, Agua Fria Peak. Um, so Cold Waters Peak where Warm Waters Halt, right? What's up there? This is Ski Mountain, right? Forrest said you could dip your toe in um, in the beginning where warm waters halt. Now, the cover of that book, does it look like possibly skiing or a ski pole? It's just a shadow, but that's the section beginning where warm waters halt is, uh, is Angel Fire Ski Resort. So that is like a ski pole. You can dip your toe in it. You put your toe inside the ski boot. It's all pretty, pretty ingenious. And again, as I said before, it took him 15 years to do this. Uh, I just kind of realized that right now looking at it. I'm like, oh my God, it looks like he's skiing because it's a shadow, but it's in the water. So it's, it's pretty cool, but it's not water. It's snow up on the mountain. It's all, it's all connected like really intricately. And he, he was a genius. So I did want to just add that part. Okay, moving on to Once Upon a While, the third book. Revised. It's a revised third memoir by Forrest Fenn. Now, what's he doing there? He's fishing, correct? Now, for those of you that have watched my videos, I have, I have a video, I believe, I didn't even look back yet, but I believe it's called uh, Palisade Sill again, like I'm, I'm like, because when I got this book, I didn't realize that little star constellation is Pleiades, which is spelled pretty close to Palisade, and he talks three times in this book about uh, misspelled words, so Pleiades, Pal Palisade, they're all the same letters, they're just mixed up, okay, and that's what he talked about. Three different times in this book how he he mixes up letters I've been criticized for the way I write and use words I say too much mix verb tenses use commas wrong and I can't spell I just read through my story above about Dizzy Dean and removed all of the commas I feel so good I may just go get myself another Dr. Pepper now Forrest Fenn is Fishing at Pleiades. Where do you think Forrest Fenn was fishing when he was a child or when he was young? Palisades? This connection is so huge, and I didn't even realize that until today. I never even looked at the uh, actual little stick figure. Fishing in Pleiades. Palisades. It's so beautiful. And, and some of you are like, oh my God, I didn't realize that either. I, the people that have watched my videos, this... This video is going to have every single thing, I should say going to have every, every single thing that I can think of. And I'm sure there's so much more that I've missed. Because 15 years, I'm not going to just solve it all like in just, 
a few months. But having this book now, this tells me right there, Forrest Fenn was fishing at Palisade Sill. And a memoir is a window, right? That's why it's a revised memoir. A window into a life. So, window, sill, Palisades, Pleiades, sill. It's all there. That's this is this is beautiful. This is this this is I'm so glad I bought this because this told me and and validated everything that I've said over the past year plus that it is it is absolutely correct. And I'm proving it to you, but as far as the covers, that's what those mean. Once upon a while, that I still kind of wonder um as far as there are some climbing areas in uh, Cimarron Canyon that the crags and different things that you can you can actually uh, climb those rock faces. But in Mexico, in New Mexico, I mean, I'm sorry, there is a there is a uh, climbing place, and one of the climbing areas is called Once Upon a Time. So I don't know if that has any significance. In in on it's right after Palisade Silt. So, there's some climbing rocks. So that's the significance to the name of the book as far as I'm concerned. But the memoirs and the Pleiades that he's fishing in is the Palisades that he's screwing up the words. And I'll be getting to that as I as I get into each part of, of uh, the video. But that's that's great. All right. Thank you. Okay, this story, Divorce Logic, um, as far as words being misspelled, this young lady, and Forrest doesn't remember her name, she was calling her husband Fred, uh, and ended up calling him Ferd by the end, she was so upset. But the actual significance to this story is, he didn't remember her name, so I don't remember her name, so for some subliminal reason, I'll call her Angel, Okay. But they get together. She does some pottery with Fred's name on it. And she lights up the kiln. Okay. Result of the high temperature firing angel. So if you take angel's fire. That's what pretty much it is. She's the one burning this up. Come on now. Uh, so angel fire is what you have, right? So angel had written her ex's name in big black letters. But I'm sure it was misspelled Ferd, it's, it said. I wondered what that was all about. Now, again, then she piled, uh, started piling a pile of rocks on the grave. And I heard her scream Fred. So this story itself uh, definitely has angel fire in there with some misspelled words. That's all in that area of angel fire to Eagle's Nest down to Palisade Sill. And this is the third book. That is definitely an honorable mention. This line right here, the final clue he said would be where they found his car in the parking lot. Okay, that is the solve on my solve. You need to go back down to the parking lot where you start and that's where you find the treasure. This is so key and this is actually in the third book too. I could do this probably with a hundred or more different things. But that's what the final clue is. Uh, it takes you right back down to where you started. In the parking lot. Folks, uh, as far as we know, the treasure was found by Jack walking through the woods for 25 days. If I'm not mistaken. I mean, there may be new, different information that's come out so far.
But I want to read this next uh, line to you out of book three from Doug Preston, explaining a few things about Forrest Fenn's hunt and his hiding of the treasure and the reasons why. So this might contradict that a little bit. He tweaked it many times over the years, making it harder. I said that there were a lot of smart people out there, and I feared the poem would be deciphered quickly and the treasure found in a week. While absolutely reliable if the nine clues are followed in order, it was extremely difficult to interpret. So tricky that he wouldn't be surprised if it took 900 years before someone cracked it. I can tell you right now, it took 10 years, and five of it was from me. And I'm the one that solved it. And I'm showing you folks every single thing that lines up and why and where and how. And I'll still keep going. Uh, as I said, this is going to be a long video. So I, I should have an intermission part here where you go grab popcorn or, or potato chips and, uh, and then come back. But I'll keep going. I hope you're still watching and you're still interested because I've got a ton more. Thank you. Okay, in the Once Upon a Wild book, Forrest did a story on sweet fragrances. Uh, different fragrances when he was a kid. He went um, went back into the pantry and tried a bunch of different things. Well, out of all of these things that he tried, bay leaves, rosemary, oregano, cloves, poppy seeds, thyme, ground cumin, paprika, turmeric, cayenne pepper, lemon pepper, mace, allspice, pickling spice, ground cardamom, nutmeg, celery salt, garlic salt. Out of all of these different spices, there's one that he leaves out. And the one that he leaves out, cinnamon. One of the most common spices, and you would think, oh, I remember French toast that my mom used to make with cinnamon or, or cinnamon buns or something. One of the most important spices that everybody probably has in there but he leaves it out for a specific reason because it is just like cimarron cinnamon cimarron there's certain specific things that Forrest did in these books that lets you know there's certain things either he left out specifically to leave that clue or he put it in so cinnamon cimarron that's your connection with that story absolutely Okay, see, these are some of the things that we're taking as fact. It's located above 5,000 feet and below 10,200 feet. Palisade Sill is at 7,680 feet. So that is actually, 7,600 is midpoint. And Forrest said, it is between. Between is means in the middle of. And at least 8.25 miles north of Santa Fe, New Mexico. Everybody wonders where to put the 8.25 in. That is actually between Clue, Home of Brown, and from there. It's 8.3 miles in that area. And the not in a graveyard, it is in a false grave as far as where the, the treasure is. But it's not a graveyard. It's not in a graveyard. Uh, and not even a real grave. It's not in an outhouse. I've been through that. It's... Uh, you go up behind the outhouse in the picnic area in Palisades to be able to get to where the blaze is. And not in a mine, tunnel, or cave. That is correct. Everybody knows that. Stay out of them. It's dangerous. And where warm waters halt is not a dam. So where warm waters halt is actually Agua Fria Peak. But Eagle's Nest has a dam there at the lake. So... People are always like, well, you said it's not it's not a dam or it's not associated with a dam. That's beginning where warm waters halt is not associated with a dam. That'll answer those questions right there. Okay, folks, one of the earlier quotes was bring a sandwich and a flashlight. Uh, I'm going to explain to you what that means briefly. Uh, bring a sandwich is because the parking area that you park at to search Palisade Hill. It's pretty much the overflow parking area. That's where I park. That's where the cross is. That's where the treasure was buried under the cross. 
uh, the very next parking lot next to that overflow area is the picnic area, Palisade picnic area. And uh, courtesy of, I just wanted to show you that's where you bring in a sandwich because you're right next to the picnic area. You're, you're, you literally drive into the picnic area and go up into the overflow. So that's your bring a sandwich and a flashlight. A lot of people don't like this answer, but it is because it, it is answered in the poem actually what you need to do uh, with the little saying, and I will be showing that, but you need to go in at night with a flashlight to dig up the treasure at that cross because you can't get caught digging in a state park. Bottom line, and for said, um, God will forgive me. That's what he does. The things that he said and some of the things that are, are risque in this whole thing, uh, that's why he knew that maybe it should all be like, brushed under the rug after the finder retrieves it, but um, as we all know, someone else retrieved it before the guy who really solved it uh, situation happened. So, thank you, but that's what a sandwich and a flashlight means. Okay? Okay, Force also said, he was asked the question, is the blaze one single object? In a word, yes. So the blaze, actually being a fire pit, is a pit. It's not a fire pits or fire pits. It is one object, one fire pit. So they also say, if you can you remove the blaze? He said, although it's possible, it's not feasible. So feasible, in other words, if you take that fire pit and you put it in your knapsack or duffel bag and you carry it down the hill and you look inside, what do you have? Do you have a fire pit anymore? No. It's not feasible to remove the actual fire pit. Okay? So as far as these quotes about what the blaze actually is, that is what he's talking about. They also ask, does the blaze face north, south, east, west? He said, as far as I know, it doesn't face any of those directions. You know why? Because it faces straight up into the air, which is no direction at all. It is just a fire pit. As far as all of those questions about what the actual blaze is, forget the feasibility of taking a fire pit up off the ground. You're going to dig up the ash and put it inside your duffel bag. It's just not going to happen. It's not feasible to remove the blaze. It is very possible. You could do it. You could take that blaze away. And it wouldn't surprise me if somebody did go up to, to Forest Fence true area where my blaze is and destroyed it. So it may never, it may not be there by the time everybody realizes who actually solved this but those are the answers for can you remove the blaze is the blaze one single object in a word yes that's how he's not he doesn't want to lie because he knows this the blaze has more it's constructed into one thing so is the blaze one object one single object in a word yes okay so it's, it's all the way he does it, he just he's tricky about everything. So I just wanted to clarify that. Okay, I want to answer this question. Did the same nine clues exist when you were a kid? And to your estimation, will they still exist a hundred years and a thousand years? The clues did not exist when I was a kid, but most of the places the clues refer to did. I think they might still exist in a hundred years. But the geography will probably change before we reach the next millennia. So what he's saying is, Palisade Cell is changing all the time. So that uh, geography is going to change constantly. It's, it's constantly pushing up. It's constantly rising. That's why he said raise the window. Um, but as far as the places existing when he was a kid, Palisade Cell may have been called Palisade Cell way back. I know that they had the the devil's mailbox in that area. But um, as far as all the names when he was a kid, all of these things have, have changed. The War Memorial was not there when he was a kid. But so but all of the places did exist. They were there. All all these this area for the map between uh, Agua Fria Peak to Eagle's Nest down to Cimarron Canyon, uh, Palisade Silt. And Gravel Pit Lakes were there, whether they were called Gravel Pit Lakes at the time. I just have to fix what I just said. Um, gravel Pit Lakes, I don't know if they've been there forever. 
they they believe they may have been created uh, when they were taking heavy loads of all different material out of there and then created lakes that way and i'm not sure when that time was but again all the things were there it was all there but it just some of it hadn't been named yet because it was back in what uh 1940s or so so i just wanted to answer that question for you but a geography probably will change before the next millennia the next thousand years that place is going to change whether the cliffs fall or whatever happens it's going to change okay this question has stumped people for the longest time and i want to make sure i don't misread it this time some folks correctly mentioned the first two clues to me in an email and then they went right past the other seven not knowing they had been so close now to explain this four said the first clue is beginning with warm water's halt right now we know in my solve that is the first clue to the map portion of the actual solve the very first clue to find the treasure is the very first stanza and I probably have the picture up right now, but you can see as I've gone alone in there and with my treasures bold, I can keep my secret where and hit the Richard's new note. That's the first clue. That is what pinpoints where you need to search. It pinpoints the area. It pinpoints exactly by him saying alone in there. That's his secret hidden area up on the ridge. But the actual very first clue in the map is beginning where warm waters halt and taken in the canyon down not far, but too far to walk. So that's clue number one, correct? So as Forrest stated, people figure out the first two clues. They figure out that they need to start at Agua Fria Peak and they go over to, well, the second clue in the map portion, which is put in below the home of Brown. There's your second clue in the map portion, okay? So now you have your two clues, all right? So begin to wear warm waters halt and take it in the canyon down, not far, but too far to walk. Clue number one in the map. Clue number two, put in below the home of Brown. Those are your two clues. They go by all the next seven clues. So your next clue is from there. It's no place for the meek. That word there is the assimilation or the association or whatever you want to call it. But that is the connection. You need to find out what the word there means. And the word there, he is specifically talking about Palisade sill and if you realize that because of the more map portion he says in that little quote because people go right by it what he says they went right past the other seven they mentioned the first two clues to me in an email and they went right past the other seven not knowing they had been so close once you pass palisade sill you are literally about 10 yards away from where he put that treasure chest he placed that pleasant treasure chest in a place he said don't go anywhere an 80 year old man wouldn't go correct if you took an 80 year old person with you to go hunting for that treasure where are they going to stay they're probably going to stay right in that picnic area or right in the parking lot they're not going to travel two miles into the wilderness not an 80 year old person that's he gave people that were 80 years old a chance to find the treasure chest if they figured out who Kent and Esther were sitting there in the parking lot. It was genius the way he did it. But as far as that quote, people figure out the first two clues. Agua Fria Peak and Homer Brown. Those are your first two physical positions. And then the third clue is Palisade Sill. From there, it's no place for the meek. And the meek is the mountain man face right beyond it. So once you realize how he specifically said that, people have. They figured out that Agua Fria Peak is the actual where, beginning where warm waters halt. And then home of the brown is the actual, literally the home of the brown's eagle's nest history. So those are your first two clues. Specific, factual places. And then... You just go right past all the rest of the clues. And he's not going to say you go past the next 
clue is the treasure. But that third clue in the map from there, that's that's your pinpoint area where the treasure is, where your search area is. It's beautiful the way he wrote it. But there's so many people in the Fen community that just won't agree with that and the way it's written. But you people out there, I know you are smarter than that. And, the, and maybe some of the... And I'm not talking all the Fen community, but I am talking about a few that just can't get it through their heads that someone else possibly solved this with every single clue solved. So I just wanted to really specify on that whole sentence and quote that Forrest said. That is perfectly how it fits. And they go right by all the rest of the clues and they miss the treasure. Not knowing they had been so close. Within 200 feet, you're within, you're literally within 10, like 10 yards. So, so be it. Okay, two other questions people have always asked. Um, were both trips made in the same day date? I made two trips from my car to the hiding place. And it was done in one afternoon. So, in one afternoon, he went from his car to the hiding place, back to his car, to the hiding place. And he was done everything within one afternoon. So if you think Forrest went out into the woods in Madison, Nine Hole, whatever, uh, two trips in one afternoon and was done. And then he got back home and his, his wife didn't even know that he had been gone. Now, if he started in the afternoon up in... Wyoming, he wouldn't have got back home until late that night. Uh, so that, it blows that right out of the water. Uh, but right at the edge of the parking lot, if you leave your car and go 12 feet in and hide the treasure chest, yes, that's exactly what he did. And then he was only two hours drive from, from home or an hour and a half. So as far as that answer, that's what that answer is. And the, uh, I'll jump right into it. There isn't a human trail in very close proximity to where I hid the treasure. Now he's, you have Clear Creek up about a mile down the canyon a mile. You have Maverick Creek Trail, um, Clear Creek Trail. It's a, this. There may be pathways, but there's no human trail within this proximity of where the treasure chest was. You have the parking area, and people look up, and you have the picnic area. There's no human trails in the proximity. Okay, the person who finds the treasure will have studied the poem over and over and thought and analyzed and moved with confidence. Nothing about it will be accidental. So, this wandering through the woods and finding the blaze and then finding the treasure sticking half out is pretty much BS. You, you are not going to find this treasure chest unless you solved the whole poem. Every answer, everything lining up perfectly. So that kind of blows out the theory of uh, the place they're calling it in Wyoming. But as far as this, I know my shit, buddy. That's it's what it is. Ask Jess, Jack Stoof to give you maybe two answers of what the clues are and see, see how much luck you have. All right, so I answered that one. Okay, a few others out of this list, and then I kind of want to get off of this whole thing here. There are nine clues in the poem. Yes, there are nine specific clues in the poem. He says, don't disregard any word. They're all, some words may not be as important, but don't disregard any of them. They're all important. Um, start at the beginning. He said that a hundred times over the years. Will the poem lead you to the treasure? Yes, if you know where to start. If you know where to start, folks, you start right at clue number one. As I have gone alone in there, into Palisade Sill. That clue right there is key. That's your first actual physical clue to find the treasure chest, not the map. Okay, so that's what he's saying. And he's said it so many times. Will the poem lead you to the treasure? Yes, if you know where to start. Are the clues in consecutive order? Yes. Don't mess with my poem. Don't slide the 
lines across don't crisscross don't take letters out don't run a squiggly line through the middle of it don't don't mess with the poem it it's beautifully written in order to give you all of the nine clues okay six seven eight nine they're all there all nine clues so don't mess with the poem just figure out where the nine clues are and then you will find the final resting place of the treasure. And I think that's all I wanted to cover on those uh, specific things. Yeah, don't mess with my poem. Okay, a couple of the things I want to um, talk about before I move on to the map portion are connections in each book with each other and how they line up with the area. Like the hints that he gave inside the book that tell you where you are location-wise, according to Agrafria Peak and Palisade Sill. And that's what I want to concentrate on just for a few minutes. Okay, starting with Monte Verde Lake. Monte Verde Lake is right down from Agrafria Peak. And it's on the way. There's two different routes to get to Cimarron Canyon. And... One of the longer routes is by Monte Verde Lake. Uh, he talks about Monte Verde a few times in the first book. In the second book, uh, I don't remember if he brought it up in the third book. It wasn't anything I, I needed to look for. But as far as Monte Verde, if you look up what Monte Verde is, uh, it's about prehistoric people um, in Chile, I think it is, that uh, it's, they found the oldest remnants of human remains. So that's why he talks about my prehistoric friends. Also, if you look up in the book here, I'll show you right now. It shows uh, Monte Verde to Horseshoe Lake. So it, this connection right there, I looked it up. I did the directions. It's 20 miles. And he also states exactly, uh, I don't mind you sharing my state parks with me. Just stay at least 20 miles away. And this is out of the Too Far to Walk book, which is where my... Uh, too Far to Walk is by the War Memorial. So it all connects together uh, in, in the uh, salt. That's where that area is. Between Agua Fria Peak and Palisade Sill, if you take Monte Verde and Horseshoe Mine, it's 20 miles between that distance. That's where the 20 miles comes in and connects perfectly with what he says in the book. Okay, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this one, but the J.R. Williams, the little cartoon things that he did in, uh, and put in his book about the story, uh, Buffalo Bill, uh, Wild Bill Hickok, um, all of those gangsters and, and Western popular people, they all visited St. James Hotel. And that's why a lot of this is brought in. The J.R. Williams pictures, he has some down at, at St. James in Cimarron, uh, in the town of Cimarron. So that's how that connection pulls in because I stayed at St. James one of the trips I went when I actually found the blaze. Uh, when I found the blaze in 2017, November 1st. So that right there is the actual connection between all of the cowboys and western people and everything. It's all the people that were down at St. James Hotel over the years. There's bullet holes in the ceiling down there. Which the bullet hole in the hat, bullet holes, um, he mentions a lot of different times. So it's it's all connected to the St. James Hotel. Okay, I just wanted to mention this quick, uh, the story Bullseye. That cactus looks like a cross now, correct? Like where the bullseye would be? Uh, I just wanted to put that in quick. Okay, Force Fen said you needed a good map. This is the map that you needed to find all of the answers that he, of the clues that he gave in the book and actually the uh, map portion when you get into um, the middle of the, ma the map. So that being said, you have um, the mountain men stories, right? He did uh, in Lewis and Clark at the, B, at the first book, he talked about uh, mountain man wisdom. That was where he brought in mountain, mountain man for the old man face in the canyon. He brought in uh, the story in book two, Too Far to Walk, 
mountain men because nobody was picking up on the mountain man in the canyon. So he actually brought in a bigger story about mountain man rendezvous um, and mountain men. So, and then in the, th the third book, he still brought in mountain man again. Um, so that's just to make that connection for the old man face in the mountain, the, uh, in that canyon, the mountain man. Um, and a mountain man's life was, was tough as hell. So that's the connection for that part of it. So actually uh, bringing in mountain man rendezvous in the first book, when he talked about mountain men in the second book, he, he brought in a part where he talked about, I hid behind a large ponderosa near the target. What he's saying there is, is pretty much, I hid the treasure behind a large ponderosa. You have ponderosa campground, which is a pretty big campground. It's not huge, but as far as for a ponderosa, it's a large ponderosa because it's a campground. It's not just a seat, a tree. Now, behind, you're traveling down the canyon towards Ponderosa. But behind you is where the target is, where the bullseye is, where the, the Palisade Sill parking area is. That's your target. That is what you're looking for. So he is pretty much telling you, I hid the treasure behind a large Ponderosa near the target. The large Ponderosa is near the target. But it's behind you. So that's how I took that connection. And that's how I came up with uh, Palisades Hill. Okay, the next thing to pinpoint Cimarron Canyon that Forrest Fenn brings up in his books. He says in the first book in the front cover, as people picked up on, uh, the word Maverick. For Maverick Campground, Maverick Creek, Maverick Trail. That, ma that word Maverick, he brings in, he doesn't bring it in specifically in the third book. But I'll tell you why. Okay, he says on the front cover of the first book, but it takes metal enough to strike the trail and enough confidence in a maverick to know that the treasure is really there for the taking. That's where he brings it up the first time. Second book, he brings up The World Lost Its Darling is uh, Amelia Earhart. She was an impulsive maverick. That was where he brings maverick up for the second time in the second book. Third book, he says, maybe it's the spirit of Amelia. That's his way of bringing in Maverick again in the third book. Because if you have read his other books about Amelia Earhart, you'll know that she was a Maverick. That's his way of bringing Maverick in three times in the stories to let you know there is something dealing with Maverick in the solve. That's why in these three books, he has certain things that he says in each book that correlate to places that are in Cimarron Canyon. And the main ones are the Gravel Pit Lakes, which is the Maverick area, the Maverick Campground area, for Maverick. He brings in the Mountain Man uh, three times to let you know about the Old Man Face. These are all certain connections that he's telling you in each different book. Okay, Forrest talks about finding the best agate rocks for marbles. There's a Jasper and agate trail in the canyon. Okay, I seem to remember Forrest Fenn having a little story about the beads that were in his bracelet. Uh, they were won in a poker game somewhere. I don't remember if it was from him or who owned them previously. But as far as a poker game mentioning that he won those beads and then had it transformed into the bracelet. Um, <clears throat> a window into life from memoir is a window into li a life. Life is a game of poker. This Black Jack campground in Cimarron Canyon. He brings in all these connections to pinpoint certain things in the canyon. Okay, I think it pretty much covered what connects into the canyon in Cimarron Canyon from the books. I don't need to keep going on that. What I want to concentrate on right now, Forrest Fenn brings up a lot, a really lot of... Um, Important people in the books between presidents, uh, movie stars, um, good housekeeping books, Dancing with the Stars. There's so many different things that he's bringing in. What I want to concentrate on, if I did all of those names and all of those 
things that he put in all three books, it, it, this would be a f five hour video and I'm not going to do that. What I want to let you know is some of the superheroes because in Force Fens, actual true solve, there is a superhero that he has incorporated in this solve, in solution to find the actual treasure chest. Now, what I want to do right now is just show you some of the superheroes that are in the books, all three books, that he brings up. And this is the connection to why there is a superhero in the soul. Okay? You have Beowulf, who's a strong and brave warrior who defeats monsters and goes on to become king. You have Mighty Mouse. Mighty Mouse is actually where the bullseye is, where the cross is. A superhero that can fly next to the cross. You have the Hulk. Simple. In the third book, another one of the superheroes was Bucky, uh, Captain America's sidekick. Uh, then we still have Captain America. And then he also moves on to Submarina and Captain America, which he says were some of his favorite superheroes. Accomplishing difficult tasks sometimes requires only a simple mental adjustment. Okay, we're getting to that part of the tape where I'm going to give you all of the information why it's Superman that Forrest Fenn is talking about in his stories. Okay, the first Superman connection I'm going to bring in is the story about Bessie and me. Bessie the cow. Okay, this is pretty pretty cool. It has to take a little bit of ingenuity to find out this information, but it can be done. And this is how Bessie connects with Superman. Okay, we're going to talk about Bessie's tail right here. But what had once been a very effective fly swatter soon became so dog chewed on the end that there was nothing left but a hard knot. It looked terrible, but she couldn't see it, and I tried not to look. Bessie, a cool chick who normally rocks a braid or a bun, can make anyone laugh and laughs at herself all, half the time. We'll be brutally honest, so only ask if you want to know. Musically inclined and intelligent, but can pack a punch like effing Superman. Okay, so... Forrest is talking about a cow, Bessie, with a tail that has like a bun on the end. That's a hard knot or braid. And he keeps hitting Forrest Fenn with it. So what does that tell you? That Bessie is a cool chick who normally rocks a braid or a bun, but can pack a punch like effing Superman. There's your first connection to the actual Superman connection. Here's another line out of the book which by then involved teaching other men to fly. That would, men don't usually fly. Uh, quote by Superman, Krypton bred me, but it was Earth that gave me all I am. How many times do you see the word bread? Well, Forrest used it twice in the first book. Faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. Forrest had, in his story, Demise of the Bullet, uh, taking a train. There's your connection with a locomotive and a bullet. Okay, there are other mentions of bullet in the other first and second book, but I want to concentrate on this one. The bullet comes home in the third book. Uh, he mentions the bullet a bunch of times and the majority of them are spelled in italic to specify. But this quote right here, the bullet was important to me at a time in my life when I was going, when I was gathering speed, so to speak. Now it's only an important memory. Now he's literally saying the bullet gathering speed faster than a speeding bullet. I mean, there's a certain point in here where you start going... Wow, this really does line up amazingly. That was 15 years of beauty and ingenious connection. So I just wanted to specify that. The bullet was important to me at a time in my... 
life when I was gathering speed. Okay, the next few pictures are going to concentrate on the Man of Steel. Every time he mentions Price of Freedom in the story, it's written in italic to stand out, to let you know it's something of importance. So what I found when I looked it up was Superman, the price of freedom is high and is a price I'm willing to pay. He actually paid the price a couple of times already. That was from Superman. And you also have Superman and the Freedom Fighters. And then it moves on to an army person, David Dixon, purpose freedom and the superman and an officer looks back he talks about superman a couple of times in his story that he talks about associating with war kind of like forrest fenn did Okay, this is a story out of the first book that I realized this was the connection to the cross that was at Palisade Cell saying, Kent and Esther. You're actually supposed to be looking for Lewis and Clark. Really, it's Lois and Clark. Clark Kent. That's the Kent on the cross at Palisade Cell. So this is the connections between Lewis and Clark and Lois and Clark and then to Clark Kent. It all just connects right together so that you know you're looking for a Kent. Um, very shortly, we're going to be doing Esther. Aunt Esther, the ugly duckling. And uh, move on from there. But something else cool, Eric Sloan's museum is in Kent. Kind of cool and important line out of the book. Uh, number three, book number three. Clark was getting a lot of publicity and winning awards at important shows. Clark was a reporter, Clark Kent, getting a lot of publicity. He was a reporter, so he was known to the public in getting publicity, uh, winning awards at important shows. Metropolitan. I took this with the association of Metropolis, where Superman and Lois Lane did the reporting. Okay, this is the last picture for the superhero connection. Uh, this is the third book. The, uh, the end of the superhero uh, comic books that he talked about. And what I wanted to concentrate on with this whole page is that Forrest Fenn's True Solve was where the cross was, where the Kent and Esther was. And I've always said that the Kent was Clark Kent for Superman. And looking for Lewis and Clark was supposed to be looking for Lois and Clark. Well, just so you know, at the end of this whole story, there's a little saying right down here that says, Lewis wins arbitration, right? Lewis and Clark, he brings it in so beautifully for Lois and Clark, Clark Kent, Superman, the superhero he doesn't mention, but he mentions a ton of others. Okay, I have to do a flashback here. This is what I'm going to call him because as I keep investigating the books, I find a lot more and a lot more that connects with this whole theme of movie stars and presidents and all famous people. Um, but as far as one thing that I want to bring up right now, that a flashback, is the more than 5,000 feet and less than 10,002, uh, right in between, right? We talked about between. Uh, there's a story that actually fits what that means, what that position is. It's called me in the middle. And that's where he was going to have his bones resting. 
um, in the middle of the, those two at 7,600 feet. So I thought that was kind of cool. I thought that was worth mentioning and bringing back. And folks, I still have a lot more to do, but I, I know that as you look at the books, you're going to find things that you're going to say, oh my God, this actually fits in here and this fits in here. There's so much more. This is 15 years of work that he did. I'm finding a lot of it because I know what to look for. But there's a lot of brilliant people out there that when they understand what they're looking for in here about the movies and how it connects with different shows, TV shows and, and stars, you will find things that you will say, hey, Dave, I, I found this. This is really cool. And I'll be glad. I, it's just what I want to put out there for people to understand, learn it, and know that this is the actual true solve that Forrest Fenn had. And how much work he did over the 15 years bringing all of this in together to connect to where I'm leading into right now. But we're going to move on to Aunt Esther. Okay, now that we're moving on to Aunt Esther, there is a, there's a couple things you need to know as far as how important that cross that Forrest found in Vietnam meant to him. Now, somebody had mentioned to me, if you were going to read one story out of the whole books, that this is what supposedly what Forrest said, uh, my war for me would probably be the one that he would suggest to read. Now, he talks about crosses and graves and grave markers throughout the, the whole book and the next books. Um, but as far as the significance to Aunt Esther on that cross that he incorporated, and I'll show you why he incorporated it. Um, I'm hoping, I'm not even going to get into the actual map. I'm going to put up a link at the end of this for you to to see the actual map. Because if I keep, I've got so much information to give you that lines up in all these books that if I start putting, I put up the map a bunch of times different ways for people to understand. But maybe now that you, if you watch this whole video, you'll understand how it fits in a little bit better for where everything lines up. And then you'll, you will realize that this is the actual, true, factual solve. So, uh, that being said, the, the my war for me, I'm going to put up some pictures and explain a little bit of things as I go along uh, about how important the cross was. And then the names. We're going to get into the names on the cross and how they fit and connect and lead you into even more clues and hints. Okay, my war for me is one of the biggest stories in The Thrill of the Chase, the first book. But I'm just going to pull out some of the critical things that I found in that chapter. So, Courage wears a crimson coat. That is a meaning for Superman. His red cape. Uh, he brings up Vietnam War many, many, many times throughout all the books. And that's to associate with the Vietnam War Memorial. This is one of the lines where he uses the word bread, as Superman does. Shiny black war memorial. He actually brings up war memorial right here. And then we go on to 300 feet. Palisade Sill is 300 feet tall. Uh, here's some more quotes out of there. A legitimate target. It was a funeral. Speaking of funeral, uh, Forrest mentioned in the first book about killing a mosquito on his arm. And 15 of his relatives came to the funeral. He also mentioned that again in the third book, almost exactly to the same quote, but something about Peggy killing a mosquito. So I thought that was kind of interesting, uh, the funeral. Okay, we have Vietnam again. He's, like I said, he mentions it a bunch of times. Uh, 300 foot high again, which is also the same height as Palisade Hill. 300 foot high and 200 foot, which is the significance in the canyon with that sign. The geography and 300 feet again. This one's across this time. He talks about the Jolly Green Giant, which I associate with the Hulk. Here he brings up Grave Marker, how strange and out of place it seemed. That's the way I felt about the Grave Marker at Palisade Sill, right next to the parking area. Like, what are two names doing on the side of a parking lot in between the parking lot and the road? So that's how I took that to associate with it. This is a big one right here. If you should ever think of me when I have passed this veil, 
and wish to please my ghost, forgive a sinner and smile at a homely girl. Listen to the way he says this. Those words were burned in my brain and I can see them just as clearly now as I did when I was so rushed. I took care to replace the stone marker as it had fallen and smooth the grass to hide over it. The promise that place made to me had been kept and mine to it as well. How innocent and foolish all of that seemed at the time, and even more so that a strangely insidious something began to gnaw at on me. This could not be the end of it. There was no feeling of closure at all, no sense of completeness. It was disappointing. This point is where forgive a sinner and smile at a homely girl was burned into his brain on how he would incorporate it into his final solution in the treasure hunt. Except for occasional flashes that insinuated something unfinished. Why did the strange clearing mean so much to me? Was it only to be drawn to that place? It was more than strange that I would fall to the ground and read such a poignant inscription. And why did the words impact me so? I had a lot to think about. And this is where he also brings in, which by then involved teaching other men to fly, my thoughts. Before I read this, this is one of the most critical paragraphs in the whole book that when you find that cross, it lets you know what you have to do when you find the cross to figure this out. And it took me to another dimension in my mind, a place I would not visit again until the grave marker entered into my life. Years later, I would meld these thoughts into one, the sum of which would change my life. I am coming to that. Okay, this is the critical paragraph that lets you know when he was in his plane getting all loopy in the middle of the night and he could like put his thumb over his eye and block out Philadelphia and millions of people. Well, this is when he came up with the idea of joining the two names together to meld the thoughts into one. This is how he's incorporating, letting you know that that Kent and Esther, how the grave marker came back into his life again. And it, it didn't it didn't occur until the grave marker would come back into his life again. But that this is where he came up with the idea to do Kent and Esther and meld the thoughts together. When you meld, you put together. Now, the closest person to the treasure has an androgynous name, correct? Androgynous is partly male, partly female. So if you take Kent and Esther, Kent's nickname is Ken. You call them Ken and Esther, mix them together, you have Ken Esther. He says, you might as well stay home and play Canasta if you can't figure out the very first clue, which is the clue that I have, number one stanza. It pinpoints Palisade Sill. So if you can't pin pinpoint Palisade Sill as your starting area, you are not going to solve the, the, the whole poem. And that's what I've said right along. If you don't have, if you don't know what the word there is, there is a place. If you don't know that place, you're not going to solve this. The place is Palisade Sill. And I haven't even started bringing up the Palisade connections in the book on this video. In other videos, other people know the Palisade Cell is the correct solve. So, you melding those names together on the cross, okay? And just to let you know, that cross, when you actually look at it, there's one nail in it. He says, if you don't understand where to begin and know what the first clue is, you might as well stay home and play Canasta. If you don't have the first clue nailed down, actually, is what he says. So that there's a nail that goes in and it's bent down in the back. That is the nailed down. And the two names together, Kent and Esther, are like when if you've watched Porky's, the Michael Hunt joke. It, it Forrest did this so it was funny. And he said you would sit down in your car and, and laugh when you realize what you've really solved and figured out. Jack, on the other hand, got in his car and he bawled his eyes out because he didn't, he apparently stole the treasure chest from Palisade Cell and is saying Wyoming. Anyways, we'll get off that subject and just concentrate on our business here, correct? Okay, so 
Kent and Esther, Ken Esther, you might as well stay home and play Ken Esther. And you know why he said Ken Esther? And I'm going to bring this up now. I'm not going to mess around with it later. This I have so much information to give you. J.D. Solinger, correct, is in the book. He talks about J.D. JD Solinger. And he goes, it was sad. It was. He started talking about him. He said he heard in all the newspapers and everything, J.D. Solinger died. Well, J.D. Solinger was the one that... He was a canasta fiend, okay? So you take you take canasta, you look up what the worst hand in canasta is, and you know what they call it? They call it as dead as canasta. That's what a really crappy hand is in canasta. So how much more dead as canasta can you get than a cross that has canasta, Ken, Kent and Esther, on it? They are both dead. Now, to bring in even more, I'm going to get on a roll here. Two people can keep a secret if one of them is dead, correct? Nobody understood what that means. Absolutely nobody I've heard ever say what two people can keep a secret is if one of them is dead. If you have two people like Kent and Esther, if one of them is dead, they're both dead. So they're going to keep the secret. That's where that comes in. And that is rating with Gold and Moore and with Captain Kidd and uh, right after he, he has the map. That is all critical information that pulls this whole thing together. And that is what I see in my head all pulled together that I want everybody else to understand. This whole solve that Force Fen did is so freaking creative and genius. And I've been saying that right along. And I'm hoping that would all... It, with all of the information that I've given you so far, you're starting to see it. Now, so I've covered Canasta, right? If you don't have the first clue nailed down, you might as well stay home and play Canasta, which is Kent and Esther on the sign, on the cross. It is not a grave. There is not poodles buried there. It is an actual grave marker for Sven put there for the identification mark of the actual buried treasure. Okay? That is how this all connects. That little saying right there that he did for this little airplane ride where he, he melded the thoughts together. And I've got more to give you for, for other things to pull that in. But that's how J.D. Solinger falls into place. He's a canasta fiend and you end up Looking up what canasta is, the worst hand, it's as dead as canasta. They're both dead. Two people can keep a secret if one of them is dead. It's, it all connects right there. And I don't know how to go further on this whole subject, but I've got more to cover in other things. But I'm going to mark down what I've done and what I've said right here. So you understand, that's the connection between this story that he's talking about. And that's why he said it's so critical. If you don't understand how he melded the thoughts together... And then he says, this is beautiful, the sum of which would change my life. The sum. If you look up sum, it's principal. Principal, if you look up his father, his, he's banged a sign into the ground at the front door. Principal, Mr. Fenn. That's your connection. The sum of the principal marking, banging the, sign, the wooden sign into the ground in front of the school because he's got his own parking space. When I park there, you're right in front of the, the cross. It is beautiful the way he brought it together. And I just, I want you all to understand it. I, and that's why I'm doing this long ass video so you all understand how it all pulls together and connects. And, and it's, it's, when you realize it, it's kind of actually magical how it all pulls together. He was brilliant. So. I'm going to end that there and keep moving on into more of my war for me, which is the homely girl, which is Aunt Esther, and I will get into that, okay? Thank you. When Forrest was getting loopy in the plane, he called it the Philadelphia caper. Caper definition is to leap or prance about. Able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. He also brought up caper in another story, the Totem Cafe Caper. Caper originates from the Italian word capriolare, meaning jump into the air. If you look up gallantry, it's bravery 
and it's also a cross and being brave. So it's that connection with brave and in the wood about where the cross is. I still value it and the appreciation that came with it. Never mind how important those things were to me at the time. Listen to the way that Forrest says this sentence. So in my mind, these lines have converged to tell a story that satisfies me in my heart. This is when Forrest came up with the idea to meld the names together. They converged and it satisfied him in his heart. Where, only there, that's Palisade Sill, and where is I can keep my secret where. Where, only there, it really counts. Why do the yellow and purple flowers flourish where no one is there to see? The answer is at last obvious to me. No one has to see what is there. The grass sees and the trees and the rushing water of the Spring Creek also see. What has made me think that I had to see the beauty that is there in order to confirm its existence? This next part is critical for the Homely Girl Cross. We are all here for the pleasure of others, everything living, only for the pleasure of others. Of course, that's it. That's why the stone marker said, and smile at a homely girl. It had to be pounded into me. That quote right there, that last line that leads into homely girl cross, that is how he interprets. Everybody's here for the enjoyment of other living creatures and things and people. Um, so what he's saying is movie stars, presidents, all the important people that we watch on the news and movies and TV shows, that's how he figured out he was going to incorporate the homely girl cross into it. And it had to be pounded into him. He finally, he finally came up with the, the reasoning of why to use what he did on the cross that he hid the treasure chest at. And I'll show you why coming up. When this realization hit me, at last I knew if I cannot enrich those to whom I interact each day and cause them to be better for having passed their view, then I've wasted my turn. That I succeed in this endeavor is not as important as it is for me to make a solid try. For if the try is sincere, I have succeeded in whatever failure resulted. This is the last line in my war for me. So now at last, at least for me, I know. And if no one should ever think of me when I have passed this veil, it will be of no consequence for I have finally found my way and I am at peace with all of it. Found my way. He figured out the way that he was gonna hide that treasure chest and come up with all of these ingenious connections to put it there. And he is at peace with all of it. That's why he says, at peace. Okay, so that is all of my war for me. That has all those connections and pulls in how you meld the names together and how he came up with the idea and, and where he was. And, and there's so much information in, in my war for me with the grave marker and the homely girl saying, and that is what we'll move on to now, Aunt Esther. Okay, what stands out there is forgive a sinner and smile at a homely girl. Now, that right there, Forrest made bells, right? That said, uh, God will forgive me. That's what he does. And there's reasons why that pulls in because he's burying those bells. He buried the treasure. But the connection between smile at a homely girl it gets a little bit racial in some of the 
terminology that's used, um, well, how he brings it in, in one of his stories about the old biddies. So I will show you that and how it, how it connects. But again, it is, it is kind of racial. It's not anything mean. It's just something that was way back when, how he, how he, and how he brings it in. So it's kind of, it's kind of funny, but it's also kind of cool. Okay, here's a quote from No Place for Biddies. Step on a crack and break your mother's back. Okay, looking up information on step on a crack and break your mother's back. Believed to be either step on a crack and your mother's baby will be black. Or step on a crack and your mother will turn black. Due to the fact that interracial marriages were frowned upon by some, it was also common then to say that stepping on the pavement lines meant you would marry a black person and have a black baby. Okay, again, this is pretty racial. Uh, I want to concentrate on due to the fact that interracial marriages were frowned upon by some. Now, that being said, the interracial marriage would be Aunt Esther is black and Clark Kent is white. That is how we have our interracial couple that is on the cross at Palisade Sill. Clark Kent, Aunt Esther. White man, black woman. Okay, Forrest Fenn's connection between Bella Abzug and Aunt Esther is Bella always had hats on and Aunt Esther always had hats on. Bella was always fighting for women's rights Aunt Esther was always fighting Fred Sanford. Okay, remember the story, Fred, Fred, Ferd? Well, Fred, ring the bell loudly for he who dies with over $50 is a failure. Fred Sanford, when he passed away, which is actually Red Fox, Eddie Murphy paid for his funeral and the headstone because Red Fox was completely broke. That's who Fred Sanford was. Okay, time for a flashback again. Remember when I was talking about all of the climbing areas in Cimarron Canyon and then at the uh, Enchanted Tower, all the names that I brought up. Well, this story would probably connect with all of that um, climbing innuendo. Teachers with ropes would make sense, right? For people climbing that tie each other up all the way up the mountain. Okay, I have some really, really interesting things that I'm going to be bringing up. And some of the Wyoming folks are probably going to be upset. I don't know. You can look into it. I'm just quoting something from the book here. Okay, I'm going to flip pages and show you exactly what I found. Okay, this little story, Lost and Found, a saga. I'm going to just, I've highlighted a couple things for you. What he says about... 1972, I was driving through Wyoming and stopped for gas in the little town of Matitsi. Okay, so he tells a little story about getting all the uh, artifacts and everything else, and he let him, they let him take the tax. But in the next page, after the truck had been unloaded, he goes, They speak volumes to me about a culture that was once dominated what is now New Mexico. Now, is he saying that it was, he was driving through Wyoming, correct? But then all of a sudden he says, what is now New Mexico? Pretty interesting, isn't it? Okay, Force Fenn mentions Dr. Pepper many times in all of the books. Uh, I'm not positive about the second book. I, I didn't even, I scanned through real quick, but I get the first book, I get the third book, and all of the Dr. Pepper um, connections. I'll show you why. 
Okay, all of the Dr. Pepper mentions in the books, he, there's at least five times here he mentions them. But what I did want to bring up, Dr. Pepper in New Jersey, you have Dr. Pepper jobs in Palisades Park, New Jersey. Pretty interesting. Okay, we're into Palisades Sill part of the video. Now, what I wanted to bring up first is uh, we have Palisade Sill. We have Fort Sill here in the book under Army Supervision. Isn't, uh, like I know in my area up here, when you have a state park, it's run by the Army Corps of Engineers. So Fort Sill, which is Palisade Sill, under Army Supervision. I thought that was kind of cool too. Okay, Route 64 leads right down into Cimarron Canyon, down to Palisade Sill, picnic area, and Palisade Sill. Now see the direction north? That comes in really important in a little while. Okay, the story Flywater, right before Golden Moor. Forrest Fenn actually is talking about Palisade Sill area, and I'll explain why. Those great places which were personal secrets to me then, I can keep my secret where, are now busy with the flourish of fishermen and women who cast a midge or floating caddis upon those same waters, never knowing I had been there or even caring yes or no. I always thought that space was mine alone and many of the memories there bred are even now still so personal that they exclude the intrusion of strangers. How dare they go there? Then he has a little bit more about the story, and this is another really important paragraph. I will rest through all of time and space, pillowed down and scented in with a smile that comes from remembering the special things that brought me to that final place, one of which was knowing Peggy was there somewhere waiting for me. Now, he talks about there and somewhere and uh, where. All this in the same words that are inside of the uh, poem. But this word intrusion, that is the most important word in the book that Forrest was talking about. Because intrusion is, when you look it up, it's intrusive igneous rock. Which is what separates that point at Palisade Cell in the canyon. Okay, geology of Cimarron Canyon. The first half of the canyon is all younger rock, and the second half from Palisades Hill is all older, tertiary, intrusive igneous rock. I can keep my secret where, where is there, is Palisades Hill, and hint of riches new and old. Younger rock in the first half of the canyon, older rock in the second half of the canyon. All of Forrest Fenn's riches. Intrusion definition. The action or process of forcing a body of igneous rock between or through existing formations without reaching the surface. Intrusive igneous rock connections in all three books. Intrusion in the first one, Intruders in the second book, also Obtruded in the second book, and then in the third book, he moves on to Quiet and Unobtrusive Way. Okay, for the next couple slides I'm going to show, uh, you need to have a better understanding of exactly what a palisade definition is. There are different explanations of it and I want to show you what they are. A few definitions for palisade. A fence of wooden stakes or iron railings fixed in the ground forming an enclosure or defense. Palisade comes from Latin palace meaning stake. The word originally applied to one of a series of stakes set in a row to form an enclosure or fortification. In time its meaning was extended to a fence of stakes and by association to stretches of steep cliffs bordering a river. A palisade is, in general, a defensive fence or wall made up of wooden stakes or tree trunks. 
Okay, in the first book, we had the story of the Totem Cafe Caper. I believe totem was the word to associate with Palisade, a wooden pole or wooden post. Okay, the second book, I believe this is the picture to identify with a palisade, which is a wooden enclosure. The third book, Once Upon a While, you have Forrest Fenn fishing at Pleiades, the Little Dipper. Now, the story we need to go to for that, Partying with Suzanne Summers is the story. It says, to a secluded parking area, which is the overflow parking area at Palisade Sill, was surrounded by 10-foot oleanders and palo verde trees. He is literally telling you a palisade right there, surrounded by 10-foot high trees. And then he also brings it within 300 feet of the house. 300 feet is what the height of Palisade Sill is. Palisade Sill Cliffs, which are 300 feet. Palisade, in his third book, within 300 feet of the house. Okay, I think we've covered enough what a palisade is. I want to do a quick flashback here to the, uh, the sum of which would change my life. The sentence is, sometimes principle is reason enough to abandon logic. Okay, folks, I really have to start uh, thinking about winding it down here. I, I still have other flashbacks I want to do. Annabella's hat is about... Annabella is a woman who, who um, used to play male roles, like as far as the androgynous, partly male, partly female. There's so many more things I want to bring in, but I, need, I do. I need to wrap this up. And what I have coming up next is kind of the, the finale of this whole video. Um, I've been tired doing this, and, uh, but I need, it, I need it to be done. I need the information to be out there. And what I go on to next is critical because this is what is going to prove everything that I've said is correct. When Forrest Fenn said that it would probably take a thousand years for somebody to figure it out, that was actually a clue for us in case any, nobody else figured it out. And I'll show you how. And this, this is, this is beautiful. I didn't even get into, um, what I need to let you people know is after this video is done, if you want to see the actual true map, you need to go to my video that is from poem to the treasure. That, that video right there, from the poem to the treasure, explains in 25 minutes the whole actual map portion of that of the uh, nine clues all right it's beautifully um, intricate and and it has pretty much everything you need to understand for the actual map I tried to make that as complete as I could in pretty much as short of time as I could this video though look out so anyways that thousand years I'll show you how that fits in but again go to from poem to treasure to see the actual map. I'm I just I'm not gonna put it in here. Alright. Thank you folks. Here we go. Okay, folks. Now for the longest time I put out many videos with all of my hints and clues, knowing that I was right, but not really know how to prove it. So now at the end of this video, I'm gonna have the biggest forest fen reveal in the history of the Forest Fen community. Okay, are you ready for this? After watching almost two hours of video to see all the connections that I knew were there, I just didn't know how and why and, and how to explain it. But I finally, looking back, I finally figured it out on how it's all connected. Okay, you know when you, you have a subject and you kind of skirt around the answers and you don't want to really tell people what's really going on, um, but you need to give them kind of clues. That's what Forrest did. This, 
Definition of dancing. Okay, we're just going to start right there. Let me show you what the definition of dancing is. Okay, I'm going to explain why it was so important, the north, for the actual solve. See where the little X is? That's where the fire pit is. And you head down towards Palisade Sill through the chase. Uh, you're heading actually the direction of north. And why it's so critical? This story right here that we talked about. I used to raise the window that was at the side of my bed and put my pillow on the sill. That was, window is palisade and uh, sill is palisade. That's your connection. I used to raise the window that was at the side of my bed and put my pillow on the sill. So again, he's telling us that the window is palisade sill. This story right here is the most important story to solve the whole ending of the chase. That's how you make that connection. So the end of the whole thing, when you find out where the blaze is, that's where this comes into play. This is one page before it's surviving myself. This little, this little paragraph right here says everything to answer from how you retrieve the treasure chest. Sometimes when it wasn't too cold, I'd get even with my father for switching me by jumping out of the window by my bed. And walking down to the cemetery. Forrest Fenn said this. T.S. Eliot really said it for me. And this should give you goosebumps. We shall not cease from our exploration, and at the end of our exploring shall be to return where we started and know the place for the first time. Which was just a block north of our house. It took guts to go in there when it was dark with no moon. Okay, that is the critical part right there. I still remember the sense of accomplishment I felt when I sat on some dead guy's grave marker. I wasn't even afraid. A kid really has time to think in a graveyard. So this, sometimes when it wasn't too cold, is actually your effort will be worth the cold. And uh, I'd get even with my father for switching me by jumping out of the window. So he'd leave the window, which is a second home in the, in the woods or in nature. By my bed which is up near the fire pit and walk down to the cemetery okay where the cross was that he hid that one little cross in the area and the treasure was found under a canopy of stars does that make sense right there so he'd walk one block north of our house it took guts and it was walked down to the cemetery so when you're up on the ridge of the fire pit you go to the front edge, it's the steepest area there, and you look down, you, you're you going to head right back down to the parking area and the road. Um, so that's what the, when you, if you've been wise and found the blaze, look quickly down your quest to cease. But tarry scant with marvel gaze, just take the chest and go in peace. He's telling you, you leave the window by my bed and walk down to the cemetery, one block north of our house. It took guts to go in there. There is Palisade Sill, when it was dark with no moon. He's telling you it took guts, brave, to go in there at night when it's dark, because that's how you have to retrieve the treasure chest. This whole saying right here is so critical for finding and retrieving the treasure chest in after you find the blaze. This is what I sent for us, Fen, and this picture... And that's why Forrest knew that it had been found by a guy from the East. It's that simple. And I just wanted to explain that as quick as I could so people understood that haven't watched my videos before. Thank you. Okay, last but not least, I pretty much covered just about everything that I want to cover. 
The only thing I didn't cover was give the poem to a child to read. Now, in the poem, it says, as I have gone alone in there. And then it says, in, uh, in other stanza, from there, it's no place for the meek. That, I believe, is why Four said give the poem to a child. Because they would pick up on, there's a specific place that he's talking about in the poem. And that's the identification marks of where it is. There. There is a place uh, put in. It's, it's perfect the way he did it. But I'm getting off of that subject. I'm done with it. Uh, Once in a while, I do something right. I'm going to show you what I did right. Um, what I want to concentrate on now is the actual whole meaning of the chase of what Forrest Fenn did to give us this whole chase and how he connected everything. I had mentioned um, Millennium. You guys know what a Millennium is. It's a thousand years. <clears throat> dancing. When you are dancing around um, a subject. This specific um, definitions of these words that to dance around something phrase verb longman advanced american dictionary to avoid discussing something or dealing with it directly to dance around a subject now when you hear dancing with the millennium it takes on a new meaning uh, does it ring a bell also when you hear dancing with the stars, it takes on a new meaning, correct? Okay, dancing with the stars again, whole new meaning. This whole paragraph and the bottom, imagination is more important than knowledge. Think about that. There are some of you people that are going to that are gonna see this and go, wow, I know what he's talking about. Others aren't going to get it like right away. They may eventually get it, but this is, this is, folks, this is it. This is the actual solve of Forrest Fenn's treasure hunt that I am going to give you right now. I've given you so much information to connect things in the book with, um, with everything, with the solve, with the poem, with the map that's in my other video. Like I said, I, I just can't put it in this one. It's too much, too much information. As far as the actual solve. Okay, his story, Dancing with the Millennium, he's telling you, you're going to be, you're going to be like trying to figure this out for a thousand years, but dancing is skirting around, um, not really telling you directly. It's just telling you indirectly how, okay, in that story of Dancing with the Millennium, okay, Dancing with the Millennium. In that story, he has written two times about dancing with the stars, right? He's skirting around all of these different stars and movie stars, TV show stars. Um, but he says, on many occasions at night while my wife was watching Dancing with the Stars, and then he also says right at the end of that whole, that whole story, he says... No matter, it was more fun to run the risk of being foolish than to watch Dancing with the Stars. He brings it up twice because all of these stories are dancing around different movie stars, presidents, um, artists. There were so many things that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a quick, quick thing. I wasn't going to do it earlier, but now I realize I have to because you need to see how many different uh, movie stars and people that he put in in his, in his books. And it's all stories about that, but the stories, you have to be able to figure out. This whole thing deals with two movie stars. Who are the top movie stars that he's trying to bring in to his stories? And those top two movie stars are Clark Kent and Aunt Esther. Those are the two main characters that are the most important out of all of these that you have to figure out. He's dancing around all of these, the different information. And people know what dancing, dancing means. So 
for that significance, it's going to take you a thousand years. It's going to take probably take people a thousand years. The millennium, dancing with the millennium, messing around. All the words that he used in here are to lead up to you figuring out who the two people were on the cross that he left at Palisade Sill, which is the word there, which is the windows, which is memoirs, which is the chase you need to find in the in the forest area, the uh, thread of track through the wilds. This is all so creative and so beautiful. And I know that, like, you've been told something different. You've been told it was in Wyoming. Well, that other story about the story Lost and Found, a saga. Okay, this is worth showing again. I was driving through Wyoming and stopped for gas at the little town of Matitsi. And then he has the whole story here. They speak volumes to me about a culture that was once dominated what is now New Mexico. That puts a little bit of a conflict on the Wyoming statement, correct? Correct. The state of Wyoming. So I'm not going to look into it. I don't really need to. I know where the actual final resting place of Forrest Fenn's treasure was. Under the cross at Palisade Sill in New Mexico. So anybody else that wants to do the investigating to know what he's really saying there, by all means, go for it. But as far as what the actual real truth is, I've given it, folks. You've been fed a few lies, and somebody's going to have to answer for it. Uh, and it's going to end up having to start with right with Jack. Jack is the man that came forward, the big face right there, that told you he's the one who found the treasure chest, and he said it was up in Wyoming. Now, we all know the controversy that goes on with that. I'm, I, I'm, I'm not going to get into it here. Again, I'm going to stop that. Uh, but I just wanted you to know there is a big controversy on the actual true solve, right? They have no answers for you. Do you wonder why? I do. I wonder why. But I know the answer. So, anyways, I just wanted to put everything out there so you folks know exactly what the actual true factual solve is. And now I'm going to give you a little snippets and I'm going to try to make them real, real snippet um, of some of the stars that were in the book. So that you see all three books, there were, there was multiple, but I'll try to do it quick. And then I think uh, I'm going to have to wrap it up and, and I've got a, a little bit of a, I don't know what to call this. Uh, if it's the finale, if it's the, um, the end game, whatever you want to, whatever you think, I'm thinking finale. Somebody else is trying to use end game and I used end game a long time ago, but people didn't get it. They didn't understand it. But now maybe, maybe now that everything is out on the table about how this all worked out and you're dancing with the stars to find all the answers through these books. Again, I've said it's genius. It's creative. Everything that I found to find the actual final resting place. And people ask me, I know it's, it's people are going to ask, why didn't you get the treasure? I had 19 years in on a career of a correction officer. So if I get caught digging in that state park, I'm going to get arrested. Now, I knew the actual solve. I knew from Forrest saying, when I found the blaze, a month later, he came out in, like I said, November 1st, 2017. He said, I have a gut feeling that the treasure is going to be found by the end of next summer. I screwed it up by, by figuring out the wrong look quickly down. Because in the pictures of where the blaze is, if you look, this is a, it goes right down into the little trench there. The chase. Look quickly down. I thought it was right there. You go right down into the trench. As he said, as I have gone alone in there. He's going in that, that ravine, the chase that leads up. So I searched that chase for two years. That's what took so long. That's what screwed the first things up. That's why Forrest was mad. And the next summer he said, my thoughts of somebody finding it are wavering. That was my fault. But 
I figured it out with the cross when I was sitting in front of the cross. And then all the other clues fell right into place. So I'm the one that solved this. Whatever they tell you or whatever they're going to end up coming up with as some kind of um, reconciliation or, or I don't know what you want to, I don't know what's going to happen. We know now, all of you know, who the actual true solver is of the Superman solve or Kent and Esther solve. Like I, like I said, I'm not, I'm not directing how this is going to work out. I'm putting the information out there. I'm letting a lot of the fan community, when they realize, okay, this guy, we busted his balls for a year now because we didn't want to listen, because we didn't, we have our own solves that we think it is. And I've tried to, tried to be courteous about everything. I, I didn't want to be mean, but when people are mean to somebody, I'm not going to run away because people have asked. I want to know the truth. I tried to give you the truth. I may not have had everything put together completely, but what I had made sense. And I have some viewers out there who knew that I was the right guy. And I commend you people because you could see, you could see certain things in the, in the videos that I had that you knew. You're like, this guy, this guy is right. But you still listen to the other videos, which I have no problem with. I have no problem with the other Ben community. It's, it's the people that are harassing me. And now I had my virus video that I put out there, who the people on the virus were. And these are people that are trying to shut my channel down and discredit me and um, say really horrendous things about me. I've only put the truth out there. When I say that it's Shiloh agreed that it was Jack. Shiloh is the guy who is behind everything. He's the one who's going to have to answer. When the lawyers start coming around that are saying, hey, Dave, we want to represent you because, you know, there's some, there's some reparations that need to be done here. Shiloh's the one that's going to have to come up with the answers. Jack knows Jack's shit. Okay, Jack, Jack is just the face put up there. So, all right, I said I wasn't going to do that, but I did. Anyways, here's some snippets for you to enjoy. All right. And I'll maybe even play some music during them. All right. Thank you. and memories Christmas cards you sent to me All that I have are these To remember you Memories that come at night Take me to another time Back to a happier day When I called you mine We sure had a good time when we started way back when Morning walks and bedroom talks are oh, how I loved you then Summer skies and lullabies Nights we couldn't say goodbye And a lot of the things that we knew Not a dream survived
photographs and memories All the love you gave to me Somehow it just can't be true It's all I've left of you But we sure had a good time When we started way back when Morning walks and bedroom talks Oh how I loved you then said it was bound to happen It's just a matter of time Now I've come to my decision And it's a one of the painful kind Cause now it seems that you wanted a martyr Just a regular guy wouldn't do But baby I can't hang on the lover's cross for you You really got a hand it to you Cause girl, you really tried But for every time that we spent laughing There were two times that I cried And you were trying to make me a martyr That's the one thing I just couldn't do Cause baby, I can't hang upon the lover's cross for you Tables are meant for turning And people are bound to change And bridges are meant for burning When the people and memories They join on the same Still I hope that you can find Another who can take But I could not It'll have to be a super guy Oh, maybe a super god Cause I never was much of a martyr before And I ain't about to start nothing new Baby, I can't hang on the lover's cross for you These tables are meant for turning And people are bound to change Bridges are meant for burning When the people and memories They join all the same But I hope that you can find Another who can take what I could not You have to be a super guy Or maybe a super god Cause I never was much of a martyr before And I ain't about to start nothing new Baby, I can't hang upon no lover's cross for you Hi folks, I'm back. Okay, I'm pretty much done all of that portion. I know this video had a lot a lot of information and the pictures that I just showed you all of the different stars throughout all of the the books um, some people still may not know exactly how this is gonna end up and I'm gonna explain it to you right now but the actual solve I had was right for said that the, the treasure was found under a canopy of stars and I've showed you that picture the little the little Guy, the little kid sitting on the uh, gravestone with the one cross under the star that has all the canopy of stars. Well, that's actually a metaphor. That is how you find it in the books. But in reality, what the whole thing is, Forrest Fenn said, Dancing with the Millennium. Now, you're going to be skirting around all these different clues and hints trying to figure it out for the next thousand years. That's why he said he didn't expect it to be solved for possibly a thousand years because all these different clues you have to finally put together. Well, putting together what you are really putting together is not dancing with the millennium. In that story, in the last, the, I believe it's the last story in. So this came out right at the beginning. I missed it. Apparently everybody else missed it. But what it really means is 
There is, he says in the story twice, Dancing with the Stars. His life, all of these books, he's telling stories of his encounters with presidents, with generals, with movie stars, with artists, with all kinds of famous people, all stars. Okay, that's all of the big picture. You have to look at this in a big picture. All of these books, and in the, in the first one also, he was telling us his story, his life little stories, once upon a time, about all these different stars that he met. So he said, the treasure was under a canopy of stars. Out of all of these stars in his little story, there were two people that were the main characters. Those two people were Clark Kent and Aunt Esther. Those are the two famous stars, the two people that you had to figure out between all of these stars that he brought in in his stories. This is where it comes in, the metaphor. A canopy of stars is all of the stars that he has in his books. But the two main people were under all of the different stars that you had to figure out who those two people were. And that was Kent Clark Kent and Aunt Esther. It was it's brilliant the way he did it. And I showed you actually um <clears throat> the, I thought it was worth mentioning an honorable mention cuz I didn't realize it either but the the uh looking for Lewis and Clark he specifically says in it uh the core of discovery, right? Lewis and Clark the the core of discovery. And it's spelled corpse. So you kind of, you're looking for somebody in a grave, a corpse of discovery. There's no core of discovery. It's core of engineers or core of something. I've never heard core of discovery, but that fits so amazingly beautiful that you're looking for Lewis and Clark. Lois and Clark, Clark Kent is the corpse of discovery. It's when it's all put together. And this is the actual salt, folks. This this is not bullshit. This is, I, I'm so happy that I finally realized that's the story that pulls this together and lets you know, I I solved it, but it lets you know what the, that's an underlying story. So the overall picture is a canopy of stars, right? It was it was under a canopy of stars, and then he put. In the lush vegetation of the forest of Rocky Mountains. So that right there, that those are the pictures that I sent him, yes. But he's still telling you that's a huge clue. It's under all of these stars and these hundreds that he put in these books. And you saw that. This that's what it is. It's dancing with the stars. He's he's mingled with all of these people all his whole life. And he's not a star. He's not anybody that that was famous in a movie. He said, I, I wanted to be like Errol Flynn. He wanted to be in with that group, and he was. He mingled with them, but it's... It, he he did it beautifully, and, and I'm sure that people know what it is right now because I, I get excited over it, and I still always have. But to actually know what the overall picture and the overall solve is, Dancing with the Stars, that's what he did. Okay, he danced with his star, the, the famous people, his whole life. And that's what these stories are. That's what it's based on. And that's who you were looking for. They're two main characters in all of the stars that he brought into his books. The secret ones that he had hidden. And that was Clark Kent and Aunt Esther. It's that simple. But you put them together and you have Kent and Esther. Put them together even more. Ken Esther. Ken Esther. You might as well stay home and play Ken Esther. This whole thing... He did this for 15 years. It wasn't a wander through the woods. So it's it's a beautiful thing. And I'm hoping that the people realize now. Because as I've said, the family has waited. Because they're waiting for you people to understand that I'm right. It, August 22nd was a big reveal, right? Never happened. And it, it still keeps getting delayed. It's supposed to come out sometime around the Super Bowl. Now... Realizing that I am the guy, my girlfriend made me tea. I thought I'd switch it up from alcohol. <laughs> no, I just, I, uh, I don't drink every night. I just want you to know that. But I, um, 
what we have here is now that the actual true solve is out there, right? Dancing with the Stars, that's probably what you people are going to want to call it. Uh, Dancing with the Stars solve. And uh, I like the Superman solve. That's my own take on it. But I was a goonie. I, I never said die. I'm not going to, I wasn't going to give up. I kept searching and kept searching and kept searching and came up with how this all incorporates like dancing with the stars. But you're, it's going to take a thousand years. So you're dancing with the millennium. It's, it's great. And the people that see it now, you really see it. It's, it's really a cool thing. And that's why this video was so intense with so many clues to let you know that it's all right. It all fits in with what I did. But it was knowing this last factor about Dancing with the Stars. And that's why I put the Dancing with the Stars music, the, the soundtrack. I thought that was kind of neat. So, now that the solve is out there, the complete, full, actual solve, and I'm sure you people will find more things that fit with Dancing with the Stars in these books, but I'm, I'm burnt. I'm burnt out. It's there. That's what it is. There's no denying it now. It was in New Mexico at Palisade Sill at that cross. It's, there's no denying it. There's, there's no way they can say that it's not. There's no, and that's what I've told them right along. Whether it's the family, we, we know that Jack is just a front. And I pick on him. Uh, I'm sorry, Jack. I pick on you, but I ask you to, to tell the truth. And you wanted to keep backing them, but you're there now. You're stuck in with them. Uh, there's no coming out of it. You're with them. You go down with them. You, you, whatever ends up happening from here on. This is, this is a turning point in the Forest Fen community. Because the people that realize, Jesus, holy mackerel. And I would say, Jesus criminy, but somebody get mad. I said, Jesus Christ the other time. And I didn't say it in a bad way. I, that would be God darn, uh, however you want to say that. But I, I, I try to be respectful. But it was an exciting way. Like, that's why I said it. So anyways, <clears throat> Jack's going to go down with him. And uh, there's, oh, there might be one way that they can get out of this that the treasure chest wasn't actually stolen from Palisade Sill. Because I've asked them, I've given them opportunities to come clean and they wouldn't. So now it's going to get to the point where, hey, Shiloh, you said that Jack was the guy. Like you should have had information from Forrest Fenn's um, material that you deleted that Jack wasn't really the guy. So what happened here? You guys are going to get questioned on this. I didn't want to sue you. I still don't really even want to sue you. I know there's going to be lawyers that are going to say, hey, Dave, you, you got a hell of a case here. Um, but it's not what I want. It's, I'm, I try to be a good guy. I try to be funny. But there's some serious shit here that you need to... This family, right now, I mean, maybe they'll come forward and say, look it, Forrest, we knew he was dying. We found out where the treasure was resting. We thought we'd take it. And then when the, somebody finally solved it, We'd come forward. Or we took it because we didn't want anybody else to die. Um, they're going to come up with something. And uh, we're going to find out what it is, right? Um, hopefully it's something respectable for the community. Because when I didn't grab the treasure chest from that spot, that spot, I left it. Okay? It was supposed to stay between Forrest and myself. That's what Forrest's agreement was. Whatever the, whatever the solver wanted... It was up to him. But when somebody else shows up with the treasure chest after it's been solved, and it was only between Forrest and I, and the family's backing them, then something's fishy there. So now there has to be some explanation that, that's going to occur. Um, because if it stayed between Forrest and I, I would have dug it up. My shoulder injury, I wasn't able to dig. I dug a little bit. Actually, I found... I, I showed some people in one of my videos. I, I dug down about a foot. Um, but the shoulder injury, the worrying about a uh, 19-year career going down the drain. And nobody believed me back then. And still nobody believed me up until recently. And 
But now there's too much information out there that I am the guy that solved this with the Dancing with the Stars solve, if that's what you want to call it. I'll stick with my own with my own name of it. But there has to be something that's answered on why they have the treasure chest. And it wasn't left there between Forrest and I, like he said. Forrest, Forrest, if you look at my Forrest Fenn Innocent video, you will see a possible timeline that I came up with of what happened after the fact. And you people know that there were things that were fishy during that whole year before Jack came forward. And even now, they're trying to say, uh, somebody sent me a message, K-Pro, oh, Aurora. Hi, Aurora. Good job out there with your videos. Um, she was saying that K-Pro came up with something. I believe that, that Kyle Lazars and K-Pro are getting paid off by Shiloh to do their videos, to do their bidding. And this guy, Bo Arrow, is infesting everybody with his, hey, good job good here, good job there. But he shits all over me for the past six months. Um, and Robert McQuaid is trying to say, hey, show me title to your truck. I offered my truck and I offered my house because I knew. I knew that I was the guy that solved it. And I would, I would have, I would have, and I said it in the video, but they kept asking for title. Um, I would give my house, the four family apartment building, and keep paying the bills. And I would do the same thing with my truck if somebody proved me wrong. But nobody's proved me wrong, so I had to prove myself right. And that's what I did. Right now, this, the video, that is it. This is the actual solve. So there's no denying that I solved it in New Mexico. So there's a lie there. And that lie, I don't believe, came from Forrest Fenn. But did you notice uh, a saga story had, he started out in Wyoming, which is now New Mexico. That would seem odd in that story. So there's so many things that I brought up that I'm, I'm not even going to investigate anymore. I'm, I've done so much here to get this information out to everybody so that they know the truth. And that's all I've said. Right along, I've said I would give everybody the truth. I've given the emails that I've gotten, some of them. I don't even feel I need to do Forrest Fenn's emails that I still have between him and I. That, that these guys, these guys... They're going to have to come up with something. That's all. And I, I hope that everybody understands that. I'm sure there's going to be plenty of questions. Uh, I will try to answer everything. But I, I do need a little bit of a break again. A couple days I've been out on this thing straight uh, for, for 12 hours a day. Making this, lining all of this up to try to make it the most intense and understandable and, uh, and complete information that I had. But there's some things that I realized and learned as I went along. And uh, the, corpse of en the Corpse of Discovery, I thought was great. That's right where the, the uh, Lewis and Clark is Lois. It's, it's beautiful. Good job, Forrest Ben. Good job, Dave Woodard from Massachusetts, the actual true man from the East. Forrest didn't let me down. He, he, he knew and he said to Jack, I know what you should do with that treasure chest. But nobody else knew what he should do with it. A lot of people will tell Jack he should stick it up his ass. But, Jack, you're the man who's going to take the brunt. And I, I warned you, buddy. I warned you. It's going to happen. So, now that the, the true solve is out, I hope I get some likes. I hope I get some follows to back me to find out. Because I want to know what the, computer, the com community, the Forrest Fan community, and the rest of the world thinks that I should get out of this. Because I solved it. And, and because of my injury and my job, I decided to wait 10 months or a little under a year to retrieve the actual treasure chest. I gave all of you people a chance to find that treasure chest. And then I would have been like, I, I screwed up. I screwed up big time. But when it's actually stolen from you by somebody that Forrest Fenn trusted... Who would be the one in the world that he would trust with that information? And they're the ones that screwed me and all of you over. Because, again, I left it knowing that it was supposed to stay between Forrest Fenn and the solver. So, shame on me, but not shame on me for somebody stealing it behind our backs. That's wrong. And something's going to happen from it. So, 
you guys have all the information now, but I want I want input on what you think should happen. Uh, I shouldn't get screwed because uh, my decision on waiting. It's just like when you wait waited for a trip to go out there to, to finish your solve or find out if your solve worked. You you waited. You had reason to wait, but you don't get you shouldn't get penalized or screwed over. There's a lot involved here that that uh, something evil and rotten has happened, and it's. But again, now the truth is out. I I hope I get a couple likes. I hope I get some smiles. So I hope I get some uh, fun, some fun out of this. And uh, let's see what happens, folks. Um, and yes, if a lawyer want, from uh, from New Mexico wants to get a hold of me, I'll be glad to talk to you. But um, I've tried to contact them. They don't call me back. Nobody would. Uh, news agencies wouldn't call me back. I finally got something from Netflix last night. Uh, the Vox Media wants to do a, a one or two minute video with me. Yay. But they don't realize I'm the guy that really solved it. They just think I'm um, uh, grouped in with all the other people who have tried. And I I feel for you people. I, uh, But I knew. I knew that I've solved it. And it wasn't exactly in order that I solved it. But I solved it. And then I figured out everything on top of it. That's an underlying story. And everything up on top of it. All the canopy of stars that he had with the two main characters. That's beautiful. Dancing with the stars. Call it what you want. But this is the solve. Folks, I have had a good time doing this video. I need to edit it for the next couple days. And, uh, and let me know your thoughts, please. And uh, tell your friends. Spread this around. Because it's this is important stuff right here. This is the end of wondering what Force Fen's actual true solve was. And that's why the family waited. And that's what you've got right now. We're going to see what they come out with. So, folks, Dave Woodard, thank you. Have a great day. And I'll see you next time.